oh, sorry, sorry, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Travis Childs and I'm the Director of Education at the History Museum. I'm also the St. Joseph County Historian. Uh, welcome to this virtual tour of Riverview Cemetery in South Bend. Because of the social distancing rules, I decided to do this first cemetery tour of 2020 online uh, to avoid any health issues that may occur with conducting this tour in person with a large group. Um, I appreciate your understanding. Um, sit back, enjoy, uh, get something to drink, uh, sit down, uh, and I hope you enjoy uh, this presentation and uh, there will be uh, a chat box uh, right around where you're watching this video where you can ask me questions. I'll be online and live and you can ask me any questions that you want. Riverview Cemetery sits on land that provided a path for Native Americans and early fur traders to this area. This path was called the Portage Path. It was an overland path that connected the St. Joseph River and the Kekakee River that was about or used to be about five miles south southwest of Riverview Cemetery. And you could follow the Kankakee River and eventually make it to the Mississippi River uh, just by ways of using the waterways as well as the Portage Path. This is the path that French explorer Robert LaSalle would use in 1679 to travel from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River. The image you see is what I believe the easiest path up from the St. Joe River. The river no longer passes by this portage where LaSalle and his party exited their canoes. That part of the river was blocked at both ends to make Pinhook Lagoon and Pinhook Park. This is the Riverview Cemetery Crematorium. It wasn't always a crematorium. When the cemetery was first established, this little building was something called a receiving vault. In the winter time, the ground was too hard to dig a grave by hand, so bodies waited in the receiving vault to wait burial in the spring when the ground actually thawed and you could actually dig a grave. The building now houses a cremation oven. The process of flame cremation involves the use of an oven, which is usually called a re retort. It's fueled by either natural gas or propane, and it cremates one body at a time. When in use, the interior of the retort or oven uh, will reach a temperature between 1500 and 1900 degrees Fahrenheit. When the crematory operator initiates the incineration cycle, it usually takes about two hours for a body to be completely reduced to just bone fragments. This is dependent on the size of the person being cremated. When the remains, or sometimes called cremains, are cool, they are removed by being thoroughly swept from the interior of the retort. The remains are put into a special processor that pulverizes and reduces the bone fragments into a finer powder that resembles beach sand. These leftovers, these cremains, are then placed into a plastic bag and placed in some kind of vessel or urn. The first uh, grave that we're going to visit this evening belongs to Colonel Joseph Turnock. He was actually born in Stoke, Trent, England on September 30th, 1836. Joseph and his family moved to America in 1839 and lived in Jersey City, New Jersey until the family moved to Mishawaka in 1849. Joseph Turnock was the oldest of 13 children and by the time he was 17, he was in charge of his father's farm until he moved to South Bend to learn the trade of a plasterer. Joseph and his brother Hiram created a contracting business which the brothers worked at for 25 years. When the Civil War actually started, he was eventually promoted to colonel, a rank that he would be known for the rest of his life. In 1872, the Republicans of St. Joseph County elected him sheriff for a period of four years. After being re-elected, he eventually served eight years before being chosen as chief of the South Bend Fire Department and afterwards, Colonel Turnock also became the chief of the South Bend Police Department. He was also the financial secretary for the Building and Loan Association of South Bend. He was married to Francis Cottrell and had two daughters. Colonel Turnock was riding in his car and was at the intersection of Main and Washington Streets, and while waiting for traffic to clear, his car shut off. 
He got out of the car immediately and went to the front to turn the crank handle to restart his car. Unfortunately, he had forgotten to take his car out of gear, and when it did start, it dragged him 600 feet until the car eventually crashed into an electric pole that crushed Colonel Turnock between the car and the pole. He died instantly June 6, 1913. The next grave belongs to Felis M. Bissell. He was an enterprising businessman in South Bend in the late 1800s. His name is remembered through Bissell Street, which runs east and west between Eddy Street and Twickenham Drive. Born March 6, 1824 in Rootstown, Ohio, Bissell was the oldest son of Alden and Hannah Bissell. His family had a small farm where Bissell worked until he took up the trades of a carpenter and a millwright. When he was 21, Bissell leased a foundry in Randolph, Ohio, where he learned how to manufacture plows. It was during this time that he invented a lathe machine and contracted Blodgett and Clark of South Bend to produce it for him. It was on this account that in 1856, Bissell came to South Bend. By 1860, he had become business partners with James Oliver, and alongside George Milburn, the pair operated the Oliver, Bissell and Company foundry on the bank of the West Race downtown South Bend. Bissell terminated his association with the Oliver Company in 1871 and went to work for a competing firm called the South Bend Chilled Plow Works. He later organized his own company called the Bissell Chilled Plow Works and eventually T.M. Bissell Plow Company. Bissell was known as a tenacious man, which is evident by the fact that he rebuilt his company twice from the ground up after it was destroyed by fire. Bissell played a critical role in the development of the agricultural industry, and he held several patents for improvements to the plow. He and his wife Ellen had two children, Essie and Frank. Mr. Bissell passed away July 23, 1892, in his home in South Bend. His death was actually the result of an injury sustained to his foot while working in one of his factories. George Ford was born on January 11, 1846, at a house at 422 South Main Street here in South Bend. His father had come to South Bend from New York State. George graduated public school and enrolled in the law school at the University of Michigan, where he graduated in 1869. The same year, he began practicing law in South Bend. In 1874, George was inaugurated as prosecuting attorney of St. Joseph County, a post he held for 10 years. In 1885, he was elected to the 49th Congress as a U.S. representative from the 13th District. Also the same year, he married Josephine Oliver, the daughter of James Oliver, the famous chill plowmaker of South Bend. George and Josephine did not have any children. His wife, Josephine, died in 1914 from uterine cancer and is not buried here in George Ford's plot that I'm showing you right now. She was interred in her father, James Oliver's, crypt, which we'll talk about soon. When George Ford died, he was buried in this plot with almost an asterisk to inform the visitor where his wife was interred. Now, George was the only Democrat in the very Republican Oliver family, but I don't know if his exclusion from the Oliver crypt was actually because of this. Joseph Benjamin Birdsell was born in Monroe County, New York on December 2, 1844, and was a son of John Conley Birdsell, who in 1855 invented the Birdsell Clover Huller, and eventually moved the family to South Bend in 1864 to build a Huller factory. J.B. Birdsell graduated from the public schools of the day and at the age of 19 entered into his father's employment in the office of the Birdsell Clover Huller Company. He held this post until 1870 when the not-so-little factory became incorporated as the Bissell Manufacturing Company. J.B. was immediately made treasurer of that company, and in the same year, the main building of the plant was built with five stories tall, being the first large factory building in South Bend. Upon the death of his father in 1894, J.B. was appointed president and treasurer of the company. He was also the director of the St. Joseph County Savings Bank. In the early spring of 1906, J.B. decided to retire and turn over responsibility to the factory to his brothers. With his wife and daughter, he traveled to Los Angeles with the intent on taking a ship to the Orient for a vacation. 
However, before leaving, he became ill and was brought back to South Bend. He suffered with this illness for three months and died September 27, 1906. His father and mother are actually buried in South Bend City Cemetery. Sarah Stockwell was born in Van Buren Township in LaGrange County in 1842. She went through the local public schools of the day and eventually enrolled in the Woolcottville Seminary, and this is where she decided to go into medicine. After graduating from the seminary, she enrolled in the University of Michigan's Medical School, where she graduated with honors in 1876. She also took a special course that taught her how to conduct surgeries and helped her with patient health care. Dr. Stockwell moved to South Bend and opened her own medical practice when women of that time did not become doctors. She specialized in women and children's health issues. She married another doctor. However, after a bout of illness, she died April 2nd, 1904. John Moeller Studebaker was born October 10th, 1833 in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. When J.M. moved to South Bend, he cut and split wood to sell and set a local record of cutting two cords of wood in one day. One cord of split firewood measures four foot high, four foot wide, and eight foot long. In the spring of 1853, a group was formed in South Bend to go overland to California. J.M. joined the wagon train west. Five months after leaving South Bend, the wagon train stopped in Hangtown, California. J.M. found work with a blacksmith and was contracted to make 25 wheelbarrows at $5 each. At the end of five years, J.M. sold his part of the wheelbarrow making business and returned to South Bend where he bought out his retiring brother Henry's part of the Studebaker Wagon Company with $8,000 in gold coins he had amassed while in California. John Moeller was the last of the five Studebaker brothers to live, and at the time of his death, he was the honorary president of the Studebaker Automobile Manufacturing Company. John Moeller Studebaker died in 1917 at the age of 83. This is the mausoleum crypt of the Oliver family. Now, James Oliver, the patriarch of the family, was a Scottish immigrant who came to America with his family in 1835. After many low-paying and menial jobs, James invented a special process by which he could make a plow blade more durable and less expensive. Eventually, the Oliver Chill Plow Works Company became the largest plow manufacturer in the world and made James and his son Joseph Doty Oliver very wealthy. Both men had large homes in the exclusive West Washington neighborhood, and around 1901, James and J.D. started building a magnificent mausoleum crypt that would hold most of the Oliver family. James's wife, Susan Catherine Doty Oliver, died in 1902, and when the mausoleum was completed, she was the first to occupy the new edifice. Most of the Oliver family are interred in the mausoleum, which is complete with a Tiffany stained glass window in the rear. There were, when the crypt was first designed, two large granite flower pots on the front of the mausoleum on each side, but they were stolen decades ago. Leighton Pine was born in New York City on February 10, 1844. As a young man, he enlisted in the Civil War and was assigned to be an Army photographer. After the war, he was employed by the Singer Sewing Machine Company. One of his first assignments was to find a place where Singer could manufacture its hardwood sewing cabinets. Mr. Pine traveled to South Bend and convinced Singer to move its cabinet manufacturing to the East Race along the St. Joseph River. In 1875, he left Singer to work for James Oliver in the Oliver Chill Plow Works. He eventually became the company's secretary. In the late 1870s, Mr. Pine founded the Economist Plow Company and the South Bend Curry Comb Company, which manufactured combs for grooming horses. Leighton Pine, however, sold his interest in these two companies to go back to work for Singer. He was in the employ of Singer until his death, September 15, 1905. 
George Wyman was born in Painesville, Ohio on January 27, 1839. He came to South Bend in August of 1860. He opened a small store on North Michigan Street in downtown South Bend that, over time, developed into a large downtown department store that was appropriately named Wyman's Department Store. Wyman's Department Store eventually purchased Ellsworth's Department Store in downtown South Bend. The new store served the community for over a hundred years and eventually closed in 1972. Mr. Wyman married in 1885 and passed away on May 14, 1913. Both Mr. and Mrs. Wyman gave large sums of money to the city of South Bend for building projects and to help support local organizations. These are the final resting places of Marvin and Myron Campbell, who were twins who were born in Valparaiso on March 13, 1849. Their graves are right next to each other. Now, Myron attended Valparaiso Male and Female College, and in 1869, he taught math at Valparaiso High School. In 1870, he accepted a math teaching position in South Bend's high school. Myron eventually left teaching and worked in the hardware business for 12 years. He sold his hardware business and bought into the Mishawaka Woolen Company, while his brother, Marvin, was employed with the Studebaker Company. Marvin left the Studebaker Company in 1899, to focus his attention on founding his new company, the Folding Box Company, which was later renamed the Campbell Folding Box Company. Both Campbell boys worked in the wooden crate and paperboard cardboard box industry. The Campbell Company was located on the southwest corner of Sample and Main Streets here in South Bend, and the building is still there. It's now occupied by two men and a truck. Myron died September 11, 1916, Marvin died January 1st, 1930. The Clem Studebaker set of family graves are unique because the headstones are arranged in a type of circle. Some say that if you look at an aerial shot of this family's plot, it looks like an S. Still others say from the air it looks like a dollar sign. Now, Clem Studebaker was born near Gaysburg, Pennsylvania on March 12th, 1831. When Clem was four years old, his family moved to Ashland, Ohio. John, his father, was a blacksmith, and Clem readily learned what his father taught him about the blacksmith's trade. When Clem was 19 in 1850, he came to South Bend, where his first job was as a teacher. He only taught two terms, left education, and joined his brother Henry in opening a small blacksmith shop at the southwest corner of Jefferson and Michigan Streets in downtown South Bend. That first year of business, the Studebaker brothers only turned out two farm wagons. This small beginning, of course, blossomed into the world's largest wagon and carriage manufacturer and later became the only wagon company to successfully convert operations to produce automobiles. Clem Studebaker married Ann Milburn, who was the daughter of George Milburn, the famous wagon manufacturer of Mishawaka. They had five children, four of whom lived to adulthood. Around 1900, Clem was having health issues and in 1901 took a trip to France to recuperate. But when he returned home, he tripped and fell getting off the ship and never did fully recover. He died on November 27, 1901 at the age of 70. Clem and his wife built Tippecanoe Place on West Washington Street. It's named Tippecanoe because legend had it that the land the home sits on was the location of the signing of the Treaty of Tippecanoe. That treaty was an agreement between the U.S. government and local Potawatomi tribes that was signed in 1832. However, we now know that this treaty was actually signed near Rochester, Indiana. A.L. Brick, or Abraham Lincoln Brick, was born in St. Joseph County on May 27, 1860. He attended the common schools of the day and graduated. He applied and was accepted and attended both Cornell University and Yale, but eventually he graduated from the University of Michigan's Law School. Mr. Brick began practicing law in South Bend in 1883. When he was 26 years old, he became the prosecuting attorney for St. Joseph and LaPorte counties. He was also elected as a representative in the House of Representatives in 1896. Mr. Brick married Anna Meyer in 1884, and they had one daughter. 
The Bricks family home was located at 745 West Washington Street, but it was torn down to make the Chapin Street extension to Lincoln Way West. Abraham Lincoln Brick died on April 7, 1908, and Brick Road is named in his honor. Alfred B. Miller was born in South Bend on February 6, 1840. His father was a printer and worked in the local printing industry. Alfred visited his father often in the printing shop, and this could account for his later career choice. While a teenager, he was working in the general store owned by John W. Chess, and when the Civil War started, Alfred enlisted in the 21st Indiana Infantry Battery. During the war, he wrote fiction and short poetry, some of which was published in Harper's Magazine, Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper, and other papers of the East. After he returned to South Bend, Alfred was employed in John Brownfield's store. He soon left the store to pursue a career in the newspaper business. With his brother-in-law, Elmer Crockett, in 1869, he purchased half interest in the St. Joseph Valley Register, a newspaper that was started by Schuyler Colfax. The name of the paper was eventually changed to the South Bend Tribune. Mr. Miller assumed the role as editor of the paper, while Mr. Crockett was the leader of the mechanical department. Alfred Miller married Esther Tarbell in 1866 and had one child, Fred, who later became the editor of his father's newspaper. Alfred B. Miller died December 10, 1892, at the age of 52. Well, there you have it, a virtual tour of Riverview Cemetery. I hope you enjoyed the tour and learned something about St. Joseph County's history. I want to thank the History Museum, Highland, and Riverview Cemetery's management for the continued support of this program and the cemetery tours that I conduct in the cemeteries that they oversee. Remember, uh, the next cemetery tour that I hope will be actually live and will be all together and in person uh, will occur August 20th at 6.30 p.m. at Bowman Cemetery, which is right across uh, from St. Matthew's Cathedral on Miami Street. Uh, that's uh, August 20th, Thursday evening at 6.30 uh, in Bowman Cemetery on Miami Street. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, I hope you had a good time. Uh, we'll see you in August. Uh, keep safe. Uh, and I'll do the same. See ya.